Good evening. Good evening, I think. Welcome to another episode. Now, we were going to call it, we called it Fabric Time for many, for about a year now. And well, when we started out, that was the name given to it by Eddie, our esteemed um, music professional, quasi professional. Um, oh, come on. Why is this not working right? Cast the whole thing, cast, and going. Ah, uh, who knows? Okay. So I was trying something new, and apparently it's not working. So, good evening, as I said before. Um, so we, we're calling this Fabric Time because when this started out, we were selling stuff on Facebook, which if you watched last week, that was kind of what we started doing. And somehow, Eddie decided to call it Fabric Time. But I realized that I was going to take this in another direction. So I thought we might retitle this whole episode or I don't know if it's going to be an episode or the series. I don't know. But Sewing Badly with Brent. Just so anybody that tunes in late or finds this, you know, six years from now on YouTube, they'll tell by the title that this is not necessarily the correct way to quilt. So that's why we've decided, I've decided as a um, made an executive decision that we're going to rename this Quilting Badly with Brent. Um, I mean, I'll offer you some tips and tricks, but like I said, I'm going to be the first to admit I'm a lazy and this is how I do things, which may not necessarily be the correct way to do things. And I thought I was all prepped for this, but I realized that I had forgotten something, but I'm not going to worry about it right now. That's another story. Um, anyway, I've got a, um, what we're going to do today, as many of you may remember, a couple weeks ago, about a month ago now, we started this quilt. And we finished it. <clears throat> Let me see if I can get this on so you can all see kind of what it looks like. Uh... Excuse the setup. So you may all remember that we started making this, and I think as far as we got was making this top row here, but this is what it came out like. And let me know if you can't hear because I'm trying something new. Hello, Nancy. I'm glad you joined us. So we made this cup about a month ago, and as you can see, it is missing. Okay, I'm gonna look, I'll show you. As you can see, it's missing the binding. So today we are going to um, put binding on this. Now, originally, originally I had planned to, you know, do this like a cooking show where I had a bunch of bindings made up and quilts in various stages of finished done so we could just whip through this and you wouldn't have to um, tune in for about an hour and a half as I try to put the binding on a quilt. But that was the plan. And then there's the reality, which I got none of that done. And all I, the most I got done was make the binding for this, which you can see here, I came prepared. So, we're gonna at least attach the binding today and then I'll show you kind of the basics of sewing it. Cause we're not gonna finish it by hand because that's just too much work. And honestly, if you're using the quilt, eh, who cares? I mean, if you're gonna do a show quilt, the only way to finish it is by hand. If you wanna be really special by hand, but um, we're gonna do it all by machine. And so also as kind of a heads up, there's a little bit of rearrangement, kind of shop news type stuff is that um, we had planned to do a Kimberbell event. Why is my machine making that? We were planning on doing a Kimberbell event next Friday and Saturday, but due to scheduling issues with the instructor, we have to, we're going to um, postpone that. We're going to be doing it the February, and plus nobody signed up either. We were still like drawing blanks on that. So what we're going to do is we're going to postpone the Kimberbell till February 4th and 5th. Oh, I can't remember. It's a Friday and Saturday in February. It is going to be February 7th and 8th. 7th and 8th? No, yeah, 7th and 8th. Yeah. So if you want, if you're interested in Kimberbell, we're going to do the Kimberbell tea party um, a week from tomorrow. But what we've had to do is we're going to have, we've, we've, we've canceled that session. We're going to actually do it um, February 7th and 8th. So Sign up because nobody was signed up for next week, and so I had to, you know, do some shuffling around because then everybody signed up. And also, it's as an event type thing, you know, we got planned for lunches and that sort of stuff. So go online, sign up if it's something you want to do. Um, and like I said, that's going to be two weeks, two weeks or a week. I don't know. Is it two weeks from tomorrow? I don't know. Look at your calendar. Whenever February seventh and eighth is, that's when we're going to do it. Um, I guess it's two weeks because we have a week after next to finish the, gym, the, the month out. All right, howdy, Jocelyn. I'm glad you're watching on your TV. Um, who else we got watching? Becky. 
That's mom. Hey, mom. Yes, I know that you thought the title of the show was so titled because, like I said earlier, so that if somebody digs this up in the archives 20 years from now, they'll know that everything I have shown them is not the correct way to quilt. So, without further ado, ado. See, if I stop talking and wave my hands, you'll all think I'm doing something. So you can see myself. Ah. I was trying something also to put to, to um, have my screen show up on the big screen over there because we have the television in the classroom. It's not working. I'm like frozen. So I have this giant picture of my head over there. It's quite disconcerting. And I have, I'm tempted to get over on my laptop and fix it. But, you know, why? I don't want to put you all through that. Um, so anyway, as I was saying, we're going to do the um, binding on this. And as Danny, Danny had taken notes last time, she's like, you should do this and this. And she had some, like I said, very good notes about the idea of doing this like a cooking show. You know how... Like Julia Childs would be like, or the, you like watch our shows and they're like, now you put it in the oven for at 350 degrees for two hours and they reach in and pull it out and it's all done to save you so you don't have to sit there and watch them. Well, I was going to, like I said, have various stages of binding done. I didn't get that far. And so we're just going to put binding on this mess here. Now, hopefully we're trying a new camera angle. Check out that angle. You get to see the, the workspace here. Now, I did have the camera over here on the table at one point, but that was bad because the table vibrated a little bit because, you know, these awesome IKEA tables, um, like I said, IKEA, I think it was like 20 bucks for this table. Um, so you can get this fine IKEA table to sew on, but with the camera on there, it shook a little bit. So I moved the angle over here. And so it's kind of weird. It's all backwards, but you can watch me sew. Hopefully you'll enjoy watching me sew. I don't know if it's worth it, but anyway. What you've got is when you start when you start putting on a binding, and like I said, there's lots of ways to put on a binding. Now, I'm going to finish this by machine. Now, if you're going to finish your binding by machine, they suggest, this is binding, look at binding bobbin. Um, I don't know if I've got those on the website yet, but you can purchase, you used to be able to purchase these for $5.95, I think. I can't remember what we sold them for, but my own great design. And if you don't want to, if you'll notice, it's just a... Um, cone with stuff wrapped around it. I did not to make it easier to wind bond binding, but hey, that's cool. But anyway, I digress. Normally when you attach binding, is there if I just talk or do you guys want to see my face as I talk? And I make like little hand puppets. Oh, I'm a puppy dog. <laughs> see if I had a if I had a shadow behind me, you could all watch. Anyway, it's so easy to get distracted when I do this. Um so and um, if you're going to attach the binding by machine, typically what they say will tell you to do is attach it first to the back, and then you would roll it to the front. Now, I don't like to do that. I like to attach to the front hand or machine finishing just because that will allow me to change my mind later if I decide that I want to do that. So just a quick thing. Um, when preparing your binding, we all know binding. There's binding. This is two and a half inches. And then you attach it all together, sew a bunch of strips together, iron it in half. I'm not going to go over that. If you want to go on YouTube, which you're watching this on YouTube, so I know you can get on YouTube. So that means you can Google or search binding, and they'll go through how to make that. Um, one of the things to keep in mind, quick question you often will get, how wide do you make your strips? I used to like three inches. I'm down to, to um, two and a half is usually what I do. There's actually a formula if you're trying to uh, figure out binding. The formula is whatever the width of your binding, so how wide do you want your binding to be, how wide, times six plus the thickness plus, that's a plus sign, plus the thickness of the quilt. Now, why times six? Because first off, you folded it in half, so then that's three. And where's your three lengths? First length is your seam allowance. Second length is the front side. Third length is the back side. So however wide you want this finished binding to be, you take that number, divide it, multiply it by six, and add in the width of the quilt. So I'm going to do a quarter inch on this. A quarter inch times six is what? Quarter inch times six, that's an inch and a half. Yeah, that math doesn't work for this. I'm going to say, okay, so we're doing um, five-eighths, whatever. That, there's, that's the formula um, with your binding times six plus like a quarter inch or a half inch for the um, thickness of the quilt. Uh, keep, I keep my life easy. I just do two and a half. If I, I could do three, but I like two. Um, that was a complete digression, and I don't know why I just rambled on about that. So, 
when doing the binding, let's get back to what we started to do here. And you can all just feel free to chime in. I, you know, I always feel like I'm talking to myself when I do this. So, you know, post your comments, please. When starting your binding, you want to give yourself a little bit extra because you're going to have to um, attach that at the end. So you want to, you know, start a little bit extra and you start in the middle of a side. Personally, I like to start in the middle of the bottom. I don't know why. That's just where I like to start. You can start on a side. Now, I should have gone through one of the things you'll run into sometimes when, it, when I quilt. When it gets quilted, sometimes the edges get pulled up. Um, so I should actually fix that. But you know what? Yeah, I should have done that before I started, but we're just going to do it. Who cares? We're just going to cheat. Ow, I should fix it. I really want to cheat, but I think that's the only spot. So you know what? I am just going to cheat a little bit. We are just going to move that in a little. Oh, you know what? Oh, we are going to cheat. Watch this. I'm going to show you guys something cool. Instead of doing a quarter inch binding, which I normally would do, we are going to take our J-foot, because I had a quarter inch on there, throw that bad boy on there, and then I'm going to turn my laser on. See, you got your laser over here. Boom. And I don't know if you can see the laser. Can you see the laser? There's a laser right there. Coming through. If I pick that up, can you see the laser? Laser. Yeah, see the laser with a little red light? So I'm going to turn that on. That's how I'm going to get my seam allowance. Is I'm going to line that. I'm going to move that with this button here over to, I don't know, three. I believe it's three and a half millimeters is about a quarter of an inch. Um, so if I put this on... Seven. Let me see that. Ah, it focus. Ooh, look at that focus. It doesn't really help. But the middle, the middle line here is three and a half. I'm gonna put this on like. Yeah, that looks good. I think. I'm just choosing something random. Now, normally I would just use a quarter inch foot and just go in a quarter inch, but because I'm being lazy and I don't feel like taking out these small issues here on the side, I'm just gonna go in closer to like a half inch, um, and that will. Probably come back to bite me in the butt here a little later, but we're not going to worry about it right now. This is I'm doing this for you all. This is for you, so you can all learn and get excited about this. All right. Is the sound all right? Because I'm using a different camera for the main camera tonight, and I don't know that the sound is as good a quality as it normally is. Can I get a big thumbs up if the sound is all right? No? Okay. No. Back to work. Yes, sound is good. Okay, so now I'm going to drop my foot. I don't think I'm in far enough. Let's go further out. I'm just adjusting. Oh, it's going to be kind of wide, but you know what? I don't care. Is that going to be too wide? You're going to go over and wrap it under. That is going to be too wide. Come back in a little bit. Yeah, let's go. You know what? Let's just do it that way. We're just going to do the edge of the foot. I was going to get fancy and use the laser, but you know what? I'm not going to bother. We're just going to do the end of the foot. Okay, so. All we're going to do now, oh, is that, I wish that was higher up. I could go get the other tripod and make it higher up, but you know what, that's, I don't, no, we're not. We're just going to do this. We're going to go. We're just going to make it work. So, you're just going to, raw edges together. You'll notice raw edges of my binding, which I made, lined up with the raw edges of the quilt. Raw edges together. That's a, that, now that this is going to be important, and I'll show you why in just a second. Um, now I have matched my thread, if you'll notice here, my fat arm's in the way. I have matched the thread, the brown, to the binding because that will be important because we're going to finish it by machine. We want to blend the thread. So we're just going to go up to the corner, like so. And what I'm going to do now, and you stop about a quarter inch from the corner. I'm going to eyeball it. It's a quarter inch. That, that's, a, that's a quarter inch right there. How do I know? Because I've got eyes. I've got an awesome eagle eye that can tell me that's a quarter of an inch. I could be wrong, but I'm not sure I care that much. So, I don't know if, you, if we're going to put that up there. See, I stopped about a quarter from the corner, maybe a little extra, and I also just want to check this over here. Yeah, see? See, because I cheated. You see that little bit right there, because I cheated? But I'm not going to worry about it, because who cares? I'm going to keep this quilt, because I like it. So, you're going to stop your stitch about a quarter in... Oh, yeah. Ow, how's that? There, that's probably better. Was that better? Wow, I fixed the zoom, okay. So, what I'm gonna do now is, so I stopped about a quarter from the corner, I don't know if you can see the stitching there. Now, like I said, raw edges together. So the raw edges of the binding, that's your raw edge there, with the raw edge of the quilt, that there. So all I'm gonna do 
fold it in half. This is where you get your 90 degree, your 45 corner when you do your when you when you do your corners when we finish it. So what you're gonna do again, because you stop at a quarter inch, if you're little, if you didn't miss it, it's not the end of the world. You come up and you make that 45 degrees. Whatever this angle is here, of course it's black because you really can't see it. Whatever this angle is ends up being here, that's the angle you're going to have when you roll this over to finish it. So if you get a nice 45 here, you're going to have a nice 45 when you roll it over to finish it. So you roll it up, again, raw edges together, and I'm going to fold this down. Notice how the raw edges stay lined up. And then the other thing you're going to notice, I'm nice and straight along there. And where that fold is, that should line that should line up pretty nicely. And that's how you make your corner. Because I know that's the part a lot of people get stuck at. So you just, that's how you do it. And now, when you're sewing this, you're going to start right at the edge. You don't need to worry about the quarter inch now. You needed the quarter inch so you had that little bit of room so you could make that fold. But here we are. We're just going to start right at the edge, and we're going to go. And look, see, see how that picked up? That's the pivot function. For any of you that's looking at buying a sewing machine, that little bit, watch the, see the foot goes down, I start to sew, I stop sewing and it comes up a little bit. I don't know if you saw that. That's the pivot function. That is one of, that's like power, I always tell people it's like power windows on your car. If you don't have it, you don't know what you're missing, but once you get it, you can't live without it. I'm told that's like heating steering wheels, but you know, everybody talks about getting a heated steering wheel. And I think to myself, that's what gloves are for, but I don't know. Maybe heating steering wheels are nice. Maybe that's what I should start comparing this to. He didn't know because I like power windows. I still don't see the. Now, a couple things to notice. You notice how that's being pulled off the, the edge of my. Go over there. I don't know if you were noticing as I, as I sew. You see how that gets pulled off the edge? So that's why getting a sewing table is really nice. Like one of those fancy koala tables, which we sell. Um, come and check it out. It's fantastic. But the reason you like a nice big sewing area is because that keeps that from pulling. So you do want to make sure that as you're doing this, that you've got a big enough table or that you keep an eye on that so it doesn't kind of pull it off to the side. I'm not going to worry about it too much. Like I said, this is a, this is a good enough for me. See, I'm one of those people who had good enough. Makes me happy. Um, wow, my hair looks awful. I got a haircut yesterday and I think I combed it to the wrong side. I don't know. So check it out. Yeah, like flock of seagulls, bad. But I'll comb it the other way. I don't know. I know I'm just talking to myself. Anyway, a lot of times when I put stuff together, like that's good enough, it's a quilt. You're supposed to use it. It's not, you know, some people like a big fancy quilt. Um, oh, it's got to be perfect and all that. You know, if that's you, that's cool. If that makes you happy. Uh, me, I don't want to stress that much. I just want to have fun. So. I don't worry about a lot of that. So like I said, if that pulls a little bit, not the end of the world for me, but that can um, cause issues later on. And because I started in the middle of the bottom, we're going down the long side. So this is gonna take just a minute for me to get all the way around. Heated steering wheels are the best, is that is according to Danny. So let me ask you this. How many times have you used your heated steering wheel in the last year? If you tell me you're using it in the middle of July, I'm going to be like, really? I mean, maybe this morning when it was like 10 degrees out. Actually, I think it was one degree out. The 10 was the point oh, uh, 1.0. Um, I could have, I could understand wanting heat, uh, a heated steering wheel for this morning. But, you know, for like the one or two times a year that I want it, I don't know. And there's just something about it. It's like, I guess if you're like a grumpy old man, a heated steering wheel is nice, but it's like, I'm not supposed to want that. You know, it's like, I'm a man. What do I need a heated steering wheel for? I can take it. But, you know, I could be wrong. Hey, mom, you're out there watching. What does dad think of heated steering wheels? Type it in. I want to know, mom. What's dad's thought of heated steering wheels? Because this is the guy. That was all excited. Not only was his pickup truck a manual, which if you want, I'm thinking in about five years, if you want an anti-theft device for your car, just get a manual and then we'll be able to steal it. But not only was he was my dad excited about the fact that his truck was a manual, he was even excited that the windows had cranks on it. One less thing to break, I think, was his thought. So 
What are his thoughts on the Heat next year? That's what I want to know. Every time it starts, so your car, it's, it's, the steering wheel is heated. I don't know. I think we're just soft, heated steering wheels. Now, one thing I would have liked that I had read about once, I don't think they make it anymore. I think it was Audi or BMW. Actually used to put heating elements in the air vents. So when you started your car, it was like having a blow dryer in there. It heated right up. You didn't have to wait for the car to heat up. That made sense to me. Because when it's 40 below out and you don't want to scrape your windshield, just turn it on and turn on the defrost. Anyway. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. Same thing. I just went down the whole side like so. And I, I guess I should pay more attention to instructing you than, than rambling on about nothing. Um, same thing. We stopped about a quarter of an inch. And I'll be honest, I'm probably close to a half an inch. I'm not super worried about it because, like I said, I'm going to finish this um, by machine. So we'll take that, whatever we're off there by, we'll, we'll come out in the wash when we, uh, when, we, when we finish it. So same thing. Now, this one's going to show up a little better because the print's not on a... Uh, on a, the, the backgrounds actually, because the last one was like on the hat, so you couldn't see the difference here. So you see how that, um, right there, 45, like I said, you want to get that 45. And, and like I said, raw edge, you've got the raw edge of your binding strip and the raw edge down the side. So you're going to bring that up, like I said, 45 degrees, whatever this angle is, that's what you end up with when, um, when you fold it over. And I'm just, now that I got this other corner to show you, I'll bring it over and show you. So, so this is actually your, your corner. Look how this turned. So, that's what we did. Our, this is the last corner we did. And my, I don't know. Auto focus. Auto focus. I don't know if auto focus. All right. So that's the last corner we did. Now, when I fold this out and over, because when we when we finish it, we're going to fold that out. Notice. That seam right there is at 45 because that's that seam's gonna match whatever we put in that corner. So that is how you get that nice looking, you know, 45 on your seam. But honestly, let's really think about this for a second. If we're putting this on by machine, I'm not sure we're super concerned about that perfect 45. <laughs> it does make it easier to have it on there, but I don't know that you'd be losing a lot of sleep over that because if you're machining this on, you just want it done. And if you just want it done, you're not really looking at those angles too closely. So you don't have to worry about somebody coming up and knocking a couple points off your show quilt because the corners are off. So, but it does make it easier when you turn it. You don't have a lot of extra left over. So, so like I said, so we're going to come up, create our 45, create our 45, and then we fold the top back down, keeping our raw edges. Like I said, you're always keeping those raw edges lined up on the outside. And then we're straight across the top there with that fold. We're coming right over on the side there. You see how we've got our piece underneath is there. And that's straight there. So that is a good corner. We're good to go. And then, like I said, we're just going to um, line that up. Holy cow, 20 minutes into this. You guys are all quiet tonight. What controversial thing can I say to get you all fired up? Anyway. Can we get more people on here? We got what five people watching? Yeah, like like subscribe and all that crap. So we get more people on here. So I don't feel like I'm uh, talking to, my, to the wall. And I'm just gonna start there in the corner, like I did. I'm not gonna worry about the half inch or any of that. I'm just gonna start right right at the close to the edge as I can get it, and I'm just gonna go. And again, look at that pivot function. Like I said, if you if you have it, you're gonna love it. It's one of those one of those functions of the machine that's well worth it. Um, Honestly, the difference, the price difference between the machine we have that doesn't have it and the one that does, I mean, it doesn't necessarily need to be that one, but it's like 800 bucks. It's like an $800 feature, but well, I guess it's not that much if you went with the NQ900, but that's kind of overkill. If you're doing that, then you might as well go to the 1350, which has the pivot function. And if you don't want the pivot function, just go back down to the PS500 because there's really not a lot of features... Now, I'm telling you all this, and if you're in the market for machines, and I'm sure if somebody has one of these, they'll be like, no, oh, I love that machine. But if you look at the Brother lineup, the PS500 and the PS700, there's not a huge difference between them. 
except the 700 has a nicer screen and it has a $200 more on the price tag. But feature-wise, the features that you're actually going to use on the machine, you might as well just go with the 500 because it's not a big enough, I don't think the features on the 700, unless you want the screen. If you're paying, you'll be screen on the 700. So, but, um, and then the 700 goes up to the, then you go up to the NQ 900. Now this is the PR, this used to be the Project Runway series that brother did, the NQ series, the NQ 575, the NQ 700, the 900, and the 1350. Um, the 1300 became the Quilt Club 1350. That one is the mach first machine, sewing machine that brother makes that has, that's the least expensive machine you can buy that brother makes that has the pivot function. That is probably our best selling machine in the store because there's a couple other things happening under the hood, uh, it, but the pivot function is what you're actually seeing and the function at, and the function you're actually gonna want. Um, so that's a real nice machine. We do it for, I can't say what we do it for because I think according to the brother contract if I can't advertise prices, and like so if you're like watching this in india and you find out how much i sell machines for i'll get in trouble so um but let, suffice it to say that the bq is the bq the quilt club 1350 fantastic machine we do really good price on them if you're looking for a good sewing machine bang for the buck that is probably the best thing going um and then like i said the ps500 is a nice is i wouldn't call it entry level the ps500 is a nice machine um it's just not going to have the pivot function. But aside from that, it's a really nice, um, another good bang for the buck, a good, a good machine. Now, if you go online, go to brother.com. If you uh, go online, go to brother.com, you, you'll see that brother makes a bazillion machines. And what makes me laugh about their whole lineup is you, if you look at them closely, a lot of them are just are the same machine, just painted different colors. So what we've done here at Four Pines Quilting is we've act, I, we've, at one time have most of the machines in here i've sewn on most of what brother has to offer we've kind of pared it down to the because i'm a practical type person like i said i'll order anything you want for a machine for machine wise if you're looking for any brothers come in here we'll sell it to you but um from a practical standpoint there's um maybe two or three sewing machines that are worth getting and not, they're all worth getting into but makes sense because if you look at Brothers lineup, it's a ton of machines. Um, so like I said, from on the sewing side only, the, the NQ, it used to be the NQ series, which is now the Pace Set or the PS500. That's kind of our entry level here. There's certainly less expensive machines that Brother makes, but that's kind of where we start because that's got the features that people want at a decent price. And then from there, we go up to the BQ1350. Now there's a few, there's a few machines in between, <clears throat> but the problem you run into with the machines in between is if you're on the lower end of the machines in between, the PS500 is going to be just as good as like the 700 features wise, and it's going to save you a little bit of money. So it doesn't make sense to get into the 700. Or if you're looking at the 900, the little bit of extra money it's going to cost to get into the 1350 is well worth it for the features you're going to get. So that's why we've got the machines we do in stock is so that it's because um, I, we've sewn on them and we've played with them and we know what's what. Now, same thing can be said also for the, uh, Embroidery machines. Brother has a huge lineup of embroidery machines. I would not, well, I don't want to say I would not recommend, but the NQ1600 is the machine that I would start with. Anything less than that uh, is not, you're going to outgrow fairly quick if you get into embroidery and it's not going to, well, some of them have color screens though, so they're not too bad. Uh, but the, the NQ1600 uh, has a 6x10 hoop, so that's a really nice machine to get into. It's got decent size hoop and the, the price isn't bad. And that, and a lot of people like the uh, 3600D. If Disney's important, you have to get the 3600D. But if Disney is not important, I, I would recommend getting the 1600, which is an embroidery only machine. Because the 3600, am I rambling? Is anybody paying attention to this ramble at this point? Um, anyway, what I was saying. If you're looking at sewing machines, the 3600D is a, is a really nice sewing machine. It's a six by 10 combo machine that Brother does. It does sewing and embroidery. But what I usually would recommend to people, if you're looking at that machine, um, like for example, Sandy bought one. She wanted that one specifically because she wanted to travel and have sewing and embroidery. So she needed it for travel. But if you're not looking for it for travel, you're just looking to get into embroidery. I, I usually recommend buying a 1600E 
and a, 13, uh, a BQ 1350. Two separate machines. Because price-wise, you're going to be if you buy both machines separately, it's going to be about the same price as the 3600D. And, they're, and you're going to have the same functionality. But what's nice about it is when you decide to upgrade your embroidery machine, you still have a really nice sewing machine as a backup machine because you're going to want to upgrade at some point. If you start out at 1600, you're going to get bit and want to go bigger. Um, and it's and you want, and you're going to want to be able to sew while you embroider. So that's a really so my strategy is usually buy the 1600 and a and a 1350 instead of instead of buying the 3600D, which is basically those two machines swooshed together into one machine. Price wise, the two separate machines are about the same price as the one machine, and you're getting all the same functionality. Except you can sew while your machine's embroidering. I'm rambling a little bit. Thank you. At least you're honest, Danny. Thank you. That was my sales pitch. So come buy a machine from me. Anyway, back to binding. Oh, I just ran the corner. I didn't. I just. Uh, who cares? You guys saw the first two corners. I'll do the. I'll do the fourth corner again and show you real close how to do it. Um, I'm gonna have to start editing these and put like music, filler music in here when you're watching me. So probably if I start to edit, <laughs> you're gonna take like these half hour videos and they're gonna be like um, two minutes. Which brings me, okay, who watching has watched? Um, yeah, who watched the, the, the who's seen that new movie that Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? Because I we watched that the other night, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go off here for a minute. Because everybody's like, "Oh, it's a fantastic movie," and but like, I don't really. Okay, this I get in trouble for saying this, but I always thought Quentin Tarantino was overrated. And so I watched that movie. <clears throat> Once upon a time in Hollywood. It's three. It's two hours and four. It's almost three hours long. And most of it consists of men or people riding in cars with cool music. Now, it just seems to me, I can understand doing that if you're trying to fill space to make it a, the movie an hour and a half long. But if you've if you got a three hour long movie, you don't need all the cars, all the people in the car, and all the music while they're riding around. It was one of those movies that's like, really? You could have. Where was the editor? Where was the guy that sits in the little editing booth and takes three hours worth of film and cuts it down to an hour and a half and says, let's get rid of all the garbage so people can stand to watch this. But, again, I'm just, I, I'm uh, rambling, but if you have a chance to see Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, um, I don't know if I recommend it. It wasn't bad. It was one of those, I didn't, I watched the whole thing, I didn't turn it off because it was stupid. Unlike like Alien Uprising, which I should have known from a name like Alien Uprising that it was just going to be bad. Um, and the fact that it was on Netflix and I'd never heard of it until I saw it on my queue. Um, see, that was like on watch when I turned it off. At least once upon a time in Hollywood, at least they didn't turn it off. Nor though, but th that being said, I could get up and go to the bathroom and not feel like I missed anything. So that should tell you pretty much how drawn out the movie was. And it's three hours, so you're going to get them to go to the bathroom at least once. Um, so, we're coming around to the fourth corner, which means we're almost done. Now, I'm not going to subject you all to um, watching me do the entire binding. I'm just going to get this attached, connect my two ends together, then show you, and then kind of show you how I do my... Um, how I do it. Because there's all sorts of fancy feet and stuff. And like I said, I'm doing this bass backwards. Most people will tell you, Brenda will tell you, and because and her bindings come out better. And maybe it's because she does more of them, but she'll tell you to put it attached to the back and roll to the front. And it's all, like I said, personal preference. Um, and I would tell you to refer to the title of this video if you wanted to, um, if my expertise were in question, look at the title. All right. We're back to, again, yeah, see, that's even close. That's like closer to a half inch. That might be a little too much. I'm going to throw that back on there to get my corner, bring it a little closer to the corner. That was a, that was a little, 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 little too generous. Little too generous. Ma, you haven't 
chimed in yet on Dad's take on heated steering wheels. All right. So, let's see. Yeah, it's a little better. Not by much. But, so, again, like I said, you want to bring this. Where's my butt for that? Yeah, we'll refocus. Okay. So, we're stopping. We should stop about a quarter of an inch from the edge. I've got close to a half inch. But the reason that you do that, because if you were sewn all the way to the edge, you wouldn't be able to fold in your uh, fold this in properly. It wouldn't go sharp to the corner. Uh, because you're over here, you'd be off by a quarter of an inch, and that'll throw things off. That's that's why you stop a quarter inch from the edge. And like I said, it doesn't have to be exactly a quarter, be a little off. So there I, there I am again, 45, straight up here. Got a 40, uh, nice 45-degree angle coming straight from the corner. Again, my raw edges, my raw edges are always staying with the raw edges of the quilt. So the raw edges of the binding are always on the raw edges of the quilt because the idea is we're trying to hide all the raw edges when we put the binding on. So we're 45, and then we're just going to bring that down like so. And look at that. Okay, again, nice and straight here. You should be able to, you should see, I don't know if you can see it, but you're right over the top there, so that looks good. And that's the fourth and final quarter. And I want to make sure, and you ever do binding, and... Um, you get to that final little bit, and you find you're like six inches short. And you got to go find another strip and sew it all on and fight with the quilt. Um, I hope that doesn't happen. I, I hope that doesn't happen tonight where I'm like uh, six inches short, but it looks like I'm good. My mental calculations came out about right. All right. And all I'm going to do now. Now we're getting to the final side. This, we're on the final side because you can see right here is where we started and we're up here. Keep in mind when, when you're finished, when you bring them together, there's a couple different ways to finish the binding. And I'll give you all a quick look on a couple of them and then I'll show you how I do it. Now, um, you all might be paying attention. You see how I should have fixed that? I'm going to cheat and move my binding a little bit. Just because I'm lazy again. So you'll notice I'm cheating the edge over a little bit here. That's because I don't want to. Because I should have prepped the quilt better, but I'm not worried about it. Worst case scenario is take the binding off and redo this. All right. So usually I like to leave myself a good foot or so. Cut points. That's another nice feature. Okay. So you see, that's where we started. That's where we ended. We got tails on both sides. I like to leave myself about a foot. So now, let's see if I can do this so you all can see it. Maybe at an angle. Who knows? I don't know. Do you guys know? All right. So we're going to tools again. Like I've said in previous videos, there's lots of tools that you need in life. An easy angle. Easy angle. Let me put my little cutting board behind it. See, an easy angle, if you can see that there. So easy angle. And this nifty little cutting board is, I think it's three by five or, no, I'm sorry. It says it's 90 centimeters by 60 centimeters. What? That's not what it is. I have no idea how big it is. It has it on the back, but I can't read it. It's all little cutting mat. Super helpful. Easy angle. It's all you need. Now, in the past... I have seen this, and in fact, I've got a couple over on my shelf. They make these little tiny binding tool things. Um, all it's going to do is exactly what I'm going to show you with this easy angle. And I know you can read them. It's got instructions on them. I haven't figured it. They're really cool. You sell a lot of them because they can demo them. And I was like, oh, my God, I have that tool. And so they buy the tool. <clears throat> they bring it home and probably forget how to use it. Uh, easy angle. You probably have one. It works just fine for what we're about to do. First thing you want to do, okay, easy. Well, let me do a close-up. See, there's an easy angle. Doo -doo -doo. See, easy angle. Easy angle. They should be available on our website for purchase. $5 flat rate shipping. There's our little, I don't know if I have these online. I don't even think I have these in stock. But anyway, there's that. First thing you do is all I'm going to do is I'm going to, the reason we do this is put it on the quilt. 
so that we don't cut our quilt when we cut our ends. So I'm just going to cut that end. I'm just going to chop a piece of this end off because I want to show you a couple different things about this. I want to chop it fairly generous so I'm not... Yeah, I did get a That's a nice thing about these fantastic cutters. You can cut sitting down. It works nicely. So that's cool. Now, what you can do if you're a super, if you don't want to do the fancy binding connection and you want it to be done, you're just making a kid for uh, a quilt for a kid and you're not too worried about the bulk. One of the tricks is to do this. Take this corner here. This is, this is like the way I used to do it before I learned other skills. Take that corner, fold it like you're doing half of like a paper airplane. I guess the only way I can do to describe it. So you see how I've just folded that corner over like that? And you take this and you just tuck it in. Doo -doo -doo. And of course, if I was smart, well, let me just cut that. So, um, yeah, I can cut a little bit of that off so if that actually works. That was, that's a little bit longer than it needs to be for this technique to work, but I'm just going to cut this. So you can all see what that looks like, and hopefully I don't cut it too short, and I can show you the proper way or how I do it. So I'm just going to chop that right there, right there. Okay. So, like I said, what you would do, see if I can do this again. So you take that and you fold this like so. So you open that up and you fold that corner in. Like that. Boom. Right? Okay. So then you would take, so I fold it, see, to the corner, fold it up like that, so you get that nice little finish there. And then you take this other end here, and you just tuck it in, like so. And you tuck it in, fold that up, and look what you're left with. There would be no raw edges if I finished sewing right up through there. You get that little, that little bit of a pocket there. And you sew it up, and it would, and that that's that's how I used to finish my bindings. Pretty simple, not a whole lot to do with. The reason that you may not like it is you get a lot of bulk here, because you've got two layers of binding, and it's all right here. And then you've also got a little bit more here where it folds over. So the the downside to doing it that way is like it's a lot of bulk, and um, and you'll feel it. It, it, it. It's it's definitely there. That's not how I do it anymore. Now. If you live in Claremont or in the immediate area of Four Pines quilting, you can always just get to this point with your quilts, this point here, well here, over here, get to this point in your quilt, get to the tash and bring it to this point, and do what some of our customers do and just bring the quilts in and I will, attach, uh, I will trim it and get it ready to attach for you. Um, Karen is probably the biggest culprit for that. She, uh, she often will get like six done at once and bring them in and we'll finish them for. So it doesn't hurt our feelings. It's really easy to do if you don't remember how to do this. What I'm about to show you, if you don't do it all the time, it's easy to forget. It's not super technical. There's no math involved. This is the no math way. This is a, this is kind of a compilation of a different ways I've seen doing it. This is the way I've always done. I've, I've learned to do it. Works really well. Um, I'm pretty straightforward. So now we're going to do some of the magic bindings. I don't know if it's magic. Anyway. Are we ready? Back to here. So what we want to do next, the first step is you want to overlap your binding. So we're going to overlap our binding, overlap one, bottom and top, one width of the binding. So we take this piece that we ch chopped off right here. Now, no, I'm not even going to get into it. One width of the binding. This is the easiest way to remember it. So this, this technique works if you're doing five-inch binding, two-and-a-half-inch binding, three-inch binding, because you're overlapping it one width of the binding. So it doesn't matter how wide the binding is, as long as you overlap it one width of the binding. How are we going to do that? We're going to go like this. We're going to drop our, our handy-dandy little cutting board down. We're going to bring this one. This one I already cut to length. Kind of, can you kind of see that? Okay. And I'm just going to lay this. We'll do this. So I've lined this up with the corner of this one so I know that that's one width of the binding so I'm going to pull the bottom one out so I don't cut that because you don't want to cut that because then you have nothing to sew to so you pull that one out and now I am just going to cut right there where one width of the binding was at now if you cheat it in a little bit cheat it in just a hair when you cut it just a tiny bit just a little bit like I got 16th of an inch 
if you cheat it in a little bit, that will that will make it a little bit tighter through here. So you don't have to be as exact on your quarter inch seam. So sometimes I'll just cheat that in like an eighth of an inch. But anyway, what you'll notice now is see the two the two pieces overlap. If I take this piece that I cut off. Do, 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 I put this on there, it overlaps one width of the binding. Can you see how that, see those two pieces overlap? I put that on top of there, it's one width. So that's, you want to cut it so you overlap one width of the binding. How many times have I said that? Probably a million. So you got to get the, get, the, get, the, get the picture. And that, if you do that, if you remember it's one width of the binding, you do not have to remember any math for this. Because like I said, that one width, will work if it's five inches if it's six inches if it's 12 inches if it's two inches or one inch if it if you overlap it one width this technique will work so there's no need for math you don't need that little like i said that little binder tool which told you all these numbers you don't need it you know just one width of the binding it's all that matters all right so now now you're going to take your easy angle and you're going to pick a side. I'm going to start with this side here. This is the one I'm starting with. Take your easy angle. Now, this is important. Let me explain to you how an easy angle works. All an easy angle is doing, I'm going to give you the green background. As you'll notice, you've got that cut line right there. That line is exactly one quarter of an inch from the edge of the easy angle. And so is that one there. So if I cut along this line, that allows for my quarter inch seam. That's all an easy angle is doing. It's just basically adding a quarter inch to stuff. So all I'm going to do now, the quarter inch, notice where the black side is at, the quarter inch. So all I'm going to do, take my binding, lay it flat like so on my awesome cutting mat, and then I'm going to put my easy angle on there. And if my strip started out at two and a half, so if you look closely and my camera focuses properly, you'll see that my two and a half line lines up there and that little, it's a little bit over there. And I'm going to have, you're going to be able to see that I have a quarter inch seam allowance on there. So that's all we're going to do. We're going to drop that on there and cut off that corner. So kaboom, look at that. Okay. Now here's the important part. This is wicked important. See, I just went back to my New England roots on that. Wicked. Wicked important. Wicked, wicked important. Now, if you'll notice, your angle can be two ways. I could have cut it that way, or I could have cut it that way. If I had cut it that way, we would have been... Okay, let's try it again. So we, we ended up cutting it this way. See how the angle goes that way. We could have cut it that way. This way here, look, the angle would have gone that way. But we cut it this way. So you know what that means? When we cut the other side, this side here, to match that side, we want to make sure that it's cut in the proper direction so it lines up with that one. Just throwing that out there. If you do it wrong, you got more fabric, sew it back on there, pain in the butt, but I've done it wrong more than once. So the way you do it is you lay it flat, open it up. Okay. Weird silence. See, that's the problem when you're like doing this all alone. Is I gotta figure out how to get music, like royalty free crap, so that I can play music in the background so the silence isn't killing. Maybe I should just edit it when I'm done. Who knows? So all I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna open this up. See how it's open? And I am just going to match. See how that matches up to that now? And I'm just gonna so that matches that. I'm just gonna make sure that I match the same way that the angle goes on the opposite side. Now I do have to open this a little bit because I'm a little close there. So that goes there. I'm going to open this up like so. And I'm going to put my handy dandy little handy dandy notebook because my clues. And I'm just going to put that on there. I don't know if you can see that through there. And I'm just going to make sure that when I cut this, I cut it that way so that they will line up. So I'm just going to do that. Now when you do this, you might find that your angle I actually have it upside down. Well, no, actually it's right side up if I look at it from the other way. So, and all I'm going to do is make sure that I'm cutting in the proper direction. And I'm just going to cut that little bit uh, off. 
no, I'm hoping that I cut that right because I don't want to have made this big deal about cutting it in the wrong direction and then show you on it's wrong. All right. So now when you look at this, look what you got. Two pieces and they fit. Oh, look at that. And you see that little bit there and that little bit there. That's your quarter inch seam. Now, a couple things that I've learned along the way. Even though, where did I put my three? I didn't put my needles, my pins. I have pins here. Pins, pins, who's got the pin cushion? Pin cushion. Where's my pin cushion? Pin cushion. Let's have an interactive. Can you see my pin cushion? If you see my pin cushion, point to the screen and say pins, pins. Any of y'all had like kids and watched like Blue's Clues or any of those other dumb shows where they're trying to be interactive? That's what it'd be like. Swiper, no swiping. Maybe we should do that. Have like an interactive. Can you can you point to the sewing machine? Uh, yeah, okay. Never mind. Like I said, I feel like I'm talking to myself. And then I wonder if this is actually working or y'all like watching this and thinking, what is wrong with that guy? Found my put pin cushion, by the way. Pins. All right. So. Watch this trick. If you've ever done this and you're trying to get this stuff pinned together, it's always fun. All you want to do, take this, fold it. Yeah. See, because that's really tight, right? You're going to try and get that pinned together and sew it. You're going to be fighting with that the whole time. If you take your quilt, fold it right about there, like so. And all I'm going to do is take a pin. A pin. See a pin? And I am just going to stick this guy just like that. I'm just going to go like that. Why? So that doesn't open on me. So now I don't have to fight with the quilt while I'm doing this. Now I'm going to do... Now here's another... This is also important. Make sure that there are no twists in your binding at this point. Because there's nothing worse than sewing this last bit together and having it all twisted. So we're going to line those up. And we're going to flatten it out and line up where we're going to put our seam. Let's see if I can do this so you can all see what I'm doing. So you take your two bit bits... Going to line up like that so you're going to you're going to want to sew along that straight line there so i'm just going to put them together like so and put a pin in it now i know i didn't go over making binding in this video but if you make your bindings and you're using the easy angle and you're doing and you're making your bindings and you're piecing them at an angle what you should notice is this should look suspiciously like what it looks like when you put two pieces of binding together before you've attached to the quilt. Because it's the same thing. That's why there's no bulk and why it looks like really good when you're done because it, it's the same connection you have to the rest of your binding pieces. So now all I'm going to do, and I don't even have a quarter inch on here, and honestly, because it's folded and everything else, you don't have to, I just kind of eyeball this and go. It's off by a hair. It's not going to be the end of the world because we're just going to, you're just going to fold it over anyway, so I'm just going to eyeball it. I'm a generous quarter inch. I know that for a fact. Not going to kill me. And Gail, if you're watching, it's not a scamp. It's a full, it's not even a quarter. It's probably closer to three eighths. Not going to kill me. The quilting police are not going to come after me. It's all right. If it's bigger than a quarter of an inch. All right. So. Oh, I forgot to take my pin out. I just pulled it and, well, that was exciting. So, if you'll just look now, see what we have there? You don't even know where it's at. That's where we're at. I'm just going to finger press that. Oh, what's that finger press? Like, oh, finger press. First time I heard that lady. Finger press. That's a finger press. That's a technical term. If if you're watching this to learn to quilt, which I would not recommend you do, you just, this is the, the term of the day, word of the day, finger press. That's finger pressing. Because you're pressing with your finger. <laughs> yeah, okay. And then if you were really hardcore, you could go back up and iron that and stuff. But I'm not a hardcore. I'm lazy. So we're just going to throw that on the machine now. Throw that on the machine. Look at this. And then we're just going to back up a little. We're just going to go back a little ways, hit the seam where we were already at, and just kind of bring it forward. Now, this is helpful when you're doing this to not have a lot of pull because it, what can happen is... Um, it can like pull it sideways and make a mess and all that stuff. But here we go. Okay. Now, 
Now, like I said, you can take that little hair off when you're cutting it to a width of the binding because what, and I'm going to show you why you might want to do that because inevitably, no matter how many times I've done this, I'm going to show you here on the close up because this always happens to me. No matter how hard I try, no matter how hard and how good I think I did, inevitably I get that right there. You see that little pucker? You see it? And I thought you take a little bit off when you overlap it, and, that part, and it doesn't. Never, I always get the pucker. But you know what? Let me show you about the pucker. You really can't see it on the other side, so I don't ever worry about it. But that's bad. So you've all stood with me for this long. It's been an hour. I commend your stamina. I don't have prizes for you. I could probably make something up, but I don't have prizes. But thank you for lasting this long. Now I'm just going to show you quickly how to finish this. It's pretty straightforward, actually. Oh, I say that. I don't think I've got the right. Yeah, there's a couple different things. I'm just going to show you how it's done. It's easier with um, different feet. Like if you have a stitch in the ditch foot or the um, bi-level foot works really easy. I'll just show you with a J foot. It'll work. Uh, not as nice. Like I said, I would probably, I might go find a stitch in the ditch foot just because I like the way it works better. Um, so back to, I guess, this here. What does that even mean, Danny? The hand signals. Again, like I said, shadow puppets. Puppy dog. Wah, wah. Okay. So, what I, this is how I do it. And again, I, like I said, this is this is me personally. What I will do, and I don't use clips. A lot of people like those weird like binder clips and stuff. I don't. I use pins, and I'll show you why I use pins. So what I'm going to do. Is I'm just going to start at a corner. I'm going to fold this over. Now, a couple things to keep in mind. What I'm going to do is I'm going to stitch in the ditch on the front. Now, the stitch on the front, the ditch on the front, now this is, this is an important concept, lines up with your seam on the back because the ditch that's been created is actually created by that seam line. So when I fold this over, as long as I'm past my seam on the back, see, over the seam, let me see if I can make that focus a little better. So, over the seam line, not over the seam line, because you can see where you can see the seam there. So you want to make sure that when you fold it over, you're clearing the seam line. If you're not, see like right there, you can't, you can see the seam. That's not over the seam line. So you want to make sure you fold it over all the way. Now that's where the pins come in. Because watch what you do with the pins. So you take this, and I'm just going to stick a pin in. And right in the ditch, I'm sticking that pin right in the ditch. And on the back side, I see where the pin comes out. So I know where my ditch is at on the back. And you don't have to do it like every, you only have to do it, you know, I don't know, every six inches or so. It's not, there's no sign. But the reason I do this is so I know... See the back? You see the back? Yep, see the pin right here? And on the front, I'm right in the ditch. That's why I like the pin. Now, you can use the clips. A lot of people like the clips. Clips are easier. Clips are fancier. They're more colorful. Um, <clears throat> I, find pin, I find pins, for as much as I say I have an allergy to pins, I find this technique to work the best for me. Because if I go through and pin everything, I keep dropping my pin cushion. If I go through and pin everything, you, I, I know that if I, I usually do this a side at a time. I'll just go down the whole side and pin it, and I know everything is right where I want it to be. There's no question. That's where I want it to be, because I'm I'm putting the pin, I'm putting the pin in the ditch, and I can see that on the back I've got plenty of space between the pin and the edge of the binding that I know that when I stitch in the ditch it will be fine, and I'll sort that later. I knew that was going to be an issue, but you know what? I don't care. When I take it home, nobody's going to complain except me. And what am I talking about? This right here. You see how I've got that little bit of the edge that rolled out? But what, I, what I'll probably do is I'll probably trim that back with a pair of scissors later. But again, there and we're there. And I'm just going to do a couple more. And, I'm, and then I'm going to see if I can't find a stitch in the ditch foot real quick. And I'll just run a quick seam so you can see how this comes out. Now. Like I said, this technique, again, like I said, pin in the ditch, 
Put it in the ditch. Okay. Gotta get the picture. So, like I said, this technique um, isn't as good as hand binding. It's always hand hand finishes the best. Uh, but who has time for that? Well, I guess if you're a pro, you do. But I just don't have the patience for it either. So, like I said, I pinned that. Let me just go find the foot I want. One second. This is the part that gets edited out at some point if I ever get ambitious enough to edit things. And I know I have a stitch in the ditch foot here somewhere. Oh, where did I leave it? I should. I was going to do this beforehand, but I didn't because, you know, that's how I roll. That's not a stitch in the ditch. That's an overcast. Oh, that'll work. That one might work. Let's get that one. What's in here? You would think that I have what I want. Oh, that's not a stitch in the Okay, well, I got to put that work. There's a couple options that you can use. Now, these feet come standard. Both these feet come standard with a brother machine. Well, most brother. Yeah, they should come with all of them, I think. All right, I'm rambling. So what we got for feet is, this is an R foot. It's uh, edge joining, I believe. That might work. Stitching the ditch foot is very similar to, um, because you've got this plate down the middle. A stitch in the ditch foot has a little bit more of a round there, so it stays in the ditch better. And it doesn't have that there. This is an edge joining foot. What I'm going to use for today, because I can't find the foot I want, and I don't want to make you all look stare at an empty screen while I talk to myself. This is the G foot. G is actually an overcast foot, which you can actually, when used properly, kind of get like that. Um, oh, it kind of looks like a uh, serger. You know what? I'm not going to use that. Hold on. Sometimes I've used this in the past, but I'm not going to do it today because it's not going to work right. Give me a second. Let me do it right. One minute. Stitch in the ditch. Where are we at? Right there. That's an edge joining. Is that an edge joining? Is that an edge joining? Let's do that one. Or you could do that one. Or. No. Left by level foot right. Left by level foot right. All right, sorry about that. And let's see, I lost all sorts of people on that. Wow. All right, so what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna put it because I knew where to look. So we have the bi-level foot, which is actually the preferred method, or this is an edge joining foot, which is also a stitch in the ditch foot, which I've used many times, but I will tell you honestly, the bi-level foot's way better. So we're just gonna pop this bad boy open and, um, You'll see here in just a minute how it works. It's fantastically awesome. We'll see if I can do this without breaking the packaging so I can sell it to one of y'all when you come in and be like, I saw that awesome video and I want that foot. So I'll sell you this when it comes time. So I'm going to do, and you know what? That's the wrong one. Okay. Bi level feet come in two sizes left, and left is not what you want for binding. And so I'm going to put left back in the package. And as luck would have it, I've got a ton of rights on the shelf. So you probably want the right. Give me a second. And if you're saying to yourself as you're watching this, by level right, and I think it's backwards, but anyway, by level right. If you're saying to yourself as you watch this, wow, what a professional video. How can I be this professional? Want to know the secret? Want to be this professional? Buy yourself a video camera and set up a YouTube account. That's how I became a professional like this. 
Wait, I'm still an amateur because I've been paid yet for this. So I apologize. For, oh, wait a second. Maybe it was the left that I wanted. I can never tell. I think it was left because I only have one left and a ton of rights, which tells me that everybody wanted a left. But here, I'm going to show you guys. So here's, a, here's the bi-level feet. So you'll notice on the bi-level feet, if you look at the bottom, it's got bi-level. Hence the name, bi-level foot. Shh. Hence the name, bi-level. See? Bi-level. If you look at it closely, you can see that this side here is thicker than that side there. And if you look at these side by side, notice how they're opposites of each other, left and right. So what you want for this is the left one. That one, the first one I had. I overthought this. That's the one you want. Now, the reason you want that, and the reason these are so magical, magical feet, is, where to put it, because it's bi-level, the side, it sits right at the edge of your binding. Oh, hold on. I'm going to show you this, too. So, because I'm going to start in this corner. Now, when you attach binding, you start in the middle. And since I make this up as I go along, I always, when I'm finishing it, machining, I start in a corner. And all you do is, so I've already pinned this side. I'm actually going to fold that over like I want it and put a pin on the top here. Look at that. Look at that fine ear. Don't you all wish you had ears like that? To my good genetics, that's why I have it. Take out the Bernsters here sometimes. Remember once as a kid hanging out in the Chickie's Beauty Coop, and for some reason started talking about noses and how Furlins have like the perfect nose. They're not too big, not too small, just the perfect size. <laughs> I always remember that. I have no idea why we're talking about that or why Chick was going on about noses, but I remember that. Good old days, the Chick Chickie's Beauty Coop. So all I've done is I've just kind of put a pin here so that I can hold that corner in place because what I want to do is I'm going to start right in that corner, right where that pin head is. So I'm actually going to have to take the pin out, but it holds it in place while I get it to where I want it to go. Now, what the magic that happens with the bi-level foot is, it's bi-level. So the thicker part of the binding rides under the thinner part of the foot. And the thinner part of the quilt, where the binding rides under here and the quilt rides under here, right there is your ditch, right there. All right, so right in there. Now, here, pro tip. Because y'all want pro tips. Look at, I'm going to bring this over here and hopefully I don't make y'all sick with the movement. If you'll notice, if you look closely, look closely. And uh, I bet you're all seasick at this point. But notice something. So, See how the bi-level lines right up there? What well, should? I'm going to move that a hair. Okay. But what's wrong with that picture if you look closely? The needle doesn't line up with the, with the ditch here. My needle's more in the center. I want it to be right there on the edge. Oh, no. How do I fix that? I know that you're asking that right now. Well, it's your lucky day. I'm going to show you how to fix that. So, so my needle is too far over. So, and this will work on most machines. It doesn't have to be a fancy machine. Most machines will do this <coughs> is your width adjustment. Most machines that have zigzag have a width adjustment. Now, if you'll notice when I touch my width, as I make it narrower, can you see the, you see the needle moving? The needle's moving. See how it moves when you adjust your width. So I'm going to move my needle, and I think way there at zero is where I want it. But you can fine-tune your width. That's how you can use your foot. And instead of trying to line your fabric up, you can use, like, the edge of the foot and then move your needle to give you your quarter inch or whatnot. So I'm just going to use my width adjustment to move that needle 
over to where it hits the ditch. That's your pro tip for the day. With adjustment to on a straight stitch will oftentimes be your um, change of needle drop. That's pretty exciting, right? You probably already knew that because I explained that to lots of people. Oh, look at that zoom right Look at how exciting that is. Doo -doo -doo. Oh wait, I hit the wrong button. I get all sorts of weird. You guys, you, you, it, oh my gosh. Okay, there we go. All right. Yes, Mr. Bill. Oh no, Mr. Bill. Um. So. Now that we've got that all lined up, I'm just going to show you how that goes. And I am going to go. I'm using my bi-level foot. And I'm just sewing right along in the ditch. Now, yeah, I should use stitch in the ditch foot. I see that now. Because how I usually do it is stitch in the ditch. But bi-level will work. It'll look fine. Now, the difference is, see, it just cruises right along. All right. I'm not going to make you all sit through that painful experience of me going all the way around, around again. So I'm just going to do that process, pin it, bring it out, I suppose, you know, I'll get seasick looking at this. All right. So then you're going to pin it. Oh, my gosh. Pin it all the way around. And you can, if you look closely, see where that stitch in the ditch are just right along there now. The problem you get when you attach your, I'll oh, see, it's a fantastic example because you were all watching me do this. See what happened? I didn't pin that far enough over. And you see how this kind of rides out. Um, so I'll have to fold that over and just kind of re-sew that because you see I didn't hit the seam line there. That's why it's important when you do this, it's, and you get that little bit of a, I don't know if you, you really can't see it on here, but you get that little bit of a flap there, but it's on the back. Now, this is why most people attach it to the back and bring it to the front because you don't need to worry about this happening if you do that because the flap is on the front and so this little stitch along here is actually tacking the flap down. Um, I like this way. I don't know why. I've always done it this way. I like this way. I think I like this way because it doesn't commit me to doing the binding. If I want to, I can change my mind at the last minute and say, I'm going to do this by hand not that it ever happens but it's a possibility no i didn't f up becky i was doing this as an as a teaching moment if i'd done it perfectly then you would all be like i gotta be perfect like brett by doing it this way you can all learn you can see that's how you're not supposed to do it yeah that's what they didn't you obviously didn't read the title quilting badly with brent there's no screw-ups here, just learning opportunities. So that's binding. I'm not going to subject you because, I mean, we've been going on now for an hour and 15 minutes. So from here on out, you just do that same process in the ditch all the way around. And when you're done, cut your thread and call it a day. And that's binding, basically. Um, and I'll take this moment. Do you all have any questions? Now that I've completely bored you with stuff for an hour and 15 minutes. But like I said, there's no there's no Mandalorian on tonight. We're still waiting for that next season to come out. So what else are you going to do on a Friday night except to watch me? Man, that haircut. I should have come the other way. Anyway, whatever. Look at that. Look, I got white hair. White hair. Yay! All right. So like I said, we've been at this for about an hour and 15 minutes. That's binding in a, in a nutshell. Uh, I didn't, like I said, didn't create the binding. That's You can look that up anywhere. It's just a bunch of strips ironed in half. Attaching the bindings, pretty straightforward. Keep your raw edges together. That's the tip there. And then finishing the edges, like I said, I like to pin it so I can see where it comes through. And then that's how I do it. Again, like I said, you can attach it to the back and roll to the front. That's the traditional way to do it if you're going to do it by machine. I don't do it that way. I guess I could. I don't know why I don't. I just like doing it the way I just did it. And so now you all can do it that way and be like disciples of Brent. You know, there'll be like this binding war in years. And they'll be like, front to the back. No, back to the front. And then the Terminators will come and kill all the humans. And I guess quilts won't matter at that point. Um, all that being said, I have six of you have made it this far. Congrats. Four of you liked. Everybody like and subscribe because apparently that's good for when I watch YouTube videos, they all say the same thing. Like, subscribe, click the notification bell. 
I guess you could do that. Uh, it's supposed to be, I, that's how you YouTube, I guess. I don't know. I haven't read like the official way to become a YouTube star. Um, and I'll ramble on now. I really should start editing these. So these ramp, these last, these rambles on the end get cut out. Um, so if there's no questions, I'll leave it open for questions for a moment. Like I said, big thing is we canceled the, um, I don't want to say canceled. Well, the Kimber Bell Tea Party that was scheduled for a week from today is actually going to be pushed off until February 7th and 8th. So if you're interested, sign up. Because I didn't have anybody signed up yet for next week's Kimber Bell anyway, so I didn't think it would be too big of a deal to push that off. If it's something you're interested in, please sign up online so that I know that you're planning on coming so that I can get lunches and all that stuff sorted. Um, and that should be online, all the details with pictures and stuff, and we should hopefully have samples in here in a little bit if you fit liked twice it goes to unlike oh yeah don't don't like it twice only like it once Tw liking it twice it unlikes and who, well i guess you could unlike me then it could be controversial anyway like i said the only news that we have is just the kimber bell has been moved out to the february 7th and 8th um also feel free to come join us and so we have a classroom set up we have machines set up just bring a project in and hang out with us it's always a good time uh and that's pretty much four pines quilting for the evening and i really appreciate you all sticking with me um i question my sanity and sometimes yours for putting up with this but hey you know if we're all having fun let's go with it thanks for watching and on that i'll have eddie to, to play us out so This shot's for you, Sarah, because if Sarah's watching, she hates it when I make dumb faces at the camera. And I know that somebody out there must love this. So there you go. Thanks for watching, and um, we'll see y'all probably in a couple weeks. Sewing badly with, or quilting badly with Brent. Goodbye. Goodbye. End stream. And she's asking me, are you sure you want to end? Yes. End my stream.